Abraham, I mean uh, Jeremiah. <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1, starting at verse 4, if you have your Bibles. I have my Bible, it's the ESV version, at least today it is. So let's look at Jeremiah chapter 1, starting at verse 4. four verse 4. And I have a little heading in my Bible, it says, The Call of Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a youth, for, all, for, for to all to whom I send you, you shall go, and whatever I command you, you shall speak. Do not be afraid of them. For I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth. The Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. See, I have set you this day over the nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to over overthrow, to build and to plant. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, You have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. God bless the reading of this word. Yes. Thank you, Paul. As um, last Sunday I mentioned that I had been to exercise at LA Fitness and no one showed for the Thursday night class. That was a week ago Thursday. And I told the aqua fit instructor that I was good. She didn't have to try to be the class for one person. I would be able to exercise on my own. But I was in, a, in an empty pool, empty room, silence for 35 minutes as I went through the different exercises that I remembered. And I shared that being alone gives you time to think. And when your mind starts to wander, in silence, it can go to a good place, it can go to some bad places. And as I felt things kind of, oh, that's negative, and I try to get back on track of thinking something positive. So I was thinking about that experience, and I went on Saturday yesterday, and um, the, the, the pool was much more full, and uh, they had the music blaring and all the things that they do in a normal class. The instructor started to move us around a lot in the water. I don't really like that, because it it's only goes up to six, no, four and a half feet is the deepest part. So I try to stay toward the middle because the closer I get to the ends, the more I'm, you know, just not as steady. So I'm trying to be, she's moving us all around and I find a set to stay. What? I don't care. I'm standing right in front, right in front of her, but I'm not moving. And at one point she looked at you and said, I think he's mad at me. She's made some comment I didn't quite hear. It. And, and then she said, I'll play a song for you. She knows I like the band Chicago. So she plays the song Saturday in the park. So you realize a lot of people knew it. We're all singing along as we're, as we're exercising and so forth. But in that song, there's a line that says, listen, children, all is not lost. And, and when I was like, thinking about not moving, I remembered a guy that two years ago, right, or March of 2020, I, I exercised right next to him until we shut down. And when we came back, found out he had died of a heart attack. And, and I started thinking about him, and then I started thinking about other people that have passed away, other people that are facing difficulties with cancer and other health, and, and it started to get just a bad place. And then I heard Chicago saying, listen, children, all is not lost. That didn't help me one little bit, because Chicago has no authority to tell me that all is not lost. Just because he had a good Saturday at the park doesn't mean everything's going to be okay. So I, I th thought about that, and, and then I said, but I have the truth of God's word, yeah, okay. and I have to keep going back to what God says is going to happen. And that's why we're studying Jeremiah. I, I don't like the times that we're in. I don't like the world situation. I don't like what I see in my government. I don't like seeing the things that just, things that were true and tried and true are being torn down. And, and 
We just need to cling to God and his word. So we're looking at Jeremiah. Last week, I introduced you to the series, and uh, we talked about he is a weeping prophet to a wayward people. It's okay when you're giving the message of God to weep. He wrote the book Lamentations because he had ministered in extremely difficult times. And I challenge you from those first three verses to ask yourself three questions. These are valid questions. Whenever you're alone in silence, who am I? Who am I really? Who is in charge? As I look at things falling apart, who is in charge here? And then who speaks truth? Because there are so many lies that want to infiltrate. The enemy is the father of lies and he wants to change me, control me by the lies. So if I regularly ask those questions, I also told you that Jeremiah's prophecies are not arranged in chronological order. I have a chart that shows where the dates are and each one, and it's like, what? But I believe, I believe he arranged those prophecies in a definite pattern, and I can't wait throughout this study to see that pattern emerge. What was he trying to say? Why did he put this here and there? Because he was trying, by the guidance of the Holy Spirit, to tell us something, to tell the, uh, Jerusalem, the, the people from Judah something. So I'm excited about this study, and I hope that we all can see today's message that God called him, and he calls us. We are all called to salvation. If God didn't call you to salvation, you wouldn't respond. No one seeks God on their own. We have to be called through creation, through the word, through family, through people. God uses people to call us. But he also calls us to serve him. And it doesn't have to be in a church ministry per se. It may be just be the best worker you can be at work. It may be just be the family member at your home. But we pray that you find the places that God is calling you to serve. My proposition this morning is, as we heed God's call, we must focus on Him above all. You know, a lot of times we get all excited about, I need to know God's will, I need to know God's guidance. No, I need to know God. Yeah. And the more I know God, the more His guidance will start to come. If He can speak to me in the pool with a Chicago band song, He can speak through anything, okay? He gets to us if we're just open to think about who He is. Let me bow on the word of prayer before we look into Jeremiah, beginning chapter 1, verse 4. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your constant reaching out to a lost world. You reached out to your people, the nation of Israel, over and over again. They, they were not faithful to you, but you remained faithful to them. And we thank you for the future where we believe there's going to be a kingdom centered in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And as we're waiting for that, we know that, that we're thankful for our nation because you have made us a strong nation. And if we continue to forsake you and the, and the things that, that helped us become a strong nation, we don't know how much longer we'll be in effect, but we know you will always be faithful. And I pray that we as the church will be faithful to you, to follow you and to walk with you. I thank you, Father. I pray that you'll have mercy on me, a sinner, that nothing I am or say will hinder your message in any way. Jesus, it's in your name I pray. Amen. First couple of verses of, well, verses 4 through 7, we're going to look at God's plan. Again, that's kind of slipping into, I need to know God's plan, I need to know God's will, but we're going to see the best way to know God's plan. The best way to know God is to see how he's at work. See his plan. Verse 4 says, Now the word of the Lord came to be saying, do you know that God's plan flows from his word? Unapologetically, whatever we do, no matter what the society, what the culture's doing, we're going to be faithful to his word. Because that's where God is at work. So shall my word be that going forth out of my mouth. It shall accomplish what I please. It shall not return to me void. We need to see that God's plan flows from his word. I was reading a couple of secular articles about some of the historical Cool thing, and I'm not going to get that historical this week. Some of you are very thankful that I gave you a five-minute window. I said I'm going to talk history for five minutes, but we'll come back, and you, you gave me that grace. Uh, but as I was reading, I was reading some secular uh, articles about history, and even they recognized in the ancient world, everything was about gods. Only Israelites served the one true God. But they all, things happened. They, they would say, God did that. Our God did that. God's trying to get our attention. So that's kind of where they're coming from. Today, we're so secular, no, it's, you know, 
we try to find anyone to blame. And that's why we have lawsuits, because we want to blame somebody when something bad happens. But we need to know that God is in charge. Now, there were false priests and prophets that spoke for false gods. And they would be, they would be used to manipulate the people. Even in Judah and in Israel, there were false prophets that would come and try to manipulate the people, speaking in God's name. So we need to see God's plan has to be flowing from his word. It's rooted in his word. Verse 5, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. God's plan is rooted in his omniscience. It flows from his word, but it's rooted in his omniscience. Where's Jeff? We have a big word here. All knowing. God knows it all. He knew him before. He knew Jeremiah before he was born. He knows. He knows it all. And he doesn't just know his servants that he calls. He knows all the nations. He knows everything that's going on in Afghanistan right now. And he is weary of it. And he is sad. Well, why don't they do something? I believe he's a good God. And he has a plan. His plan is based on his knowledge, which goes beyond mine. Because many times when people are persecuted for their faith, there is a revival. When people see them willing, other people standing up, even to the point of death, other people submit to what they were believing. So I don't know what God's doing, but God knows what he's doing there. His plan is rooted in his omniscience. God's plan is achieved by his omnipotence. Look at verse 6 through the beginning of verse 7. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, behold, I do not know how to speak, for I am only a youth. But the Lord said, Do not say I am only a youth. What are your best excuses to God? Oh, I can't do that. I'm getting older. My feet are unsteady. My eyesight's bad. All the things that I think about, my problems. Wait a minute, I'm not depending upon my power, I'm depending upon his. That's that omnipotence that's all powerful. See, we're learning about God through his plan. It comes, it flows from his word, it's rooted in his omniscience, it is achieved by his omnipotence. There's nothing that he cannot do. Nothing is too difficult for him. That's a verse coming up later in Jeremiah. But then the last part of verse 7: For to all to whom I send you, you shall go. And whatever I command you, you shall speak. Now this is a call to Jeremiah. But when I first read that recently, I thought, oh, does Jeremiah even get a choice? Not really. He can fight it. But God said, it's going to happen. So do you want to fight me the whole time? Or do you want to submit to me? You will go where I send you. You will speak what I told you to speak. God's plan is certain in his sovereignty. Sovereignty bothers us because we like freedom. We like to sense that we're in control. I'm never in control. I can barely control myself, let alone the situations around me. I have to trust that God is in control. He is the sovereign one. Remember one of the questions we asked last week, who's in charge? Who's in charge? God is in charge. And the sooner we're willing to submit to that, the better life will be in our relationship with him, and in our walk in this world. So we see God's plan, a good way to focus on who God is when you start to see what he's doing. In you, through you, around you, look at God's plan. The next thing we see is God's encouragement. God's encouragement, look at verse eight. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you to deliver you, declares the Lord. Fear not, I will deliver you. I love those, that phrase, fear not. It happens a lot in the scriptures. Fear not. And he says, I will deliver you. I think about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, which kind of happened at the same time after, after Nebuchadnezzar. Well, actually, he had taken, remember, he took Daniel and his friends in the first time that Nebuchadnezzar was taking people from the land. Jeremiah was a prophet through that whole time. So he took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and they refused to worship the, the big idol that it was placed there when the music played, they're supposed to bow down, but it did not bow down. And he said, I'm going to throw you in that fire. He said, okay, throw us in. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we will not bow down to your idol. 
See, we have to understand God will deliver. Wait a minute. God can deliver. He will deliver. Maybe in death, he will deliver you to heaven. Maybe he will deliver you like he did them. But Jesus came into that fiery furnace and was with them. And they walked out. Not even the scent of smoke on them. We had a fire at our house last night. We had a controlled fire. You know, we were doing it on purpose. And you know, you get a little bit smoky when you do that. They didn't even have any smoke on them. But the people that threw them in, just from getting close, died. See, God says, fear not, I will deliver you. And you may not always agree on the way he chose to deliver you, but be sure he's delivering you. Verse 9. Then the Lord put out his hand and touched my mouth, and the Lord said to me, Behold, I have put my words in your mouth. Fear not, I will equip you. One of the things that people don't want to sign up for things in church is because we just say, okay, go make it happen. We have to be better at making sure you're prepared. But you need to know if you express interest that we will work with the Lord's help to help you feel equipped to do the things that you would do. He said, I'm touching your mouth so you will be able to speak. Remember in Isaiah, the, the other large uh, uh, major prophet touched his mouth for, for the sin. He was, I'm a man of unclean lips and he touched his mouth. I'm a man of unclean lips. I need my mouth touched for many reasons, but to serve him, to speak his words. Fear not, I will equip you. Now maybe if God had a cold mouth, would he reach out and touch our mouth or would he touch our thumb? How many things do you communicate this way anymore? With me, I do it on the, the keyboard and the computer. Touch my hands. He will equip us. He will give us the strength to do the things. As we knew we were going to have a fire out in the backyard last night, we know that there was a, a big floodlight that was burned out in our house. Nancy said, can you reach it to pull it out? I could. Of course, I pulled the light out and the, middle, the last little part was still in there. So now I'm starting to question, do I have the electrical knowledge to make sure I'm not going to kill myself to get that out of there? <laughs> and I found ways to check it, and I verified it with everybody around me and said, this makes sense, right? And then I put the pliers in, yeah, we're okay. <laughs> and then, then I was still, and I actually put a, a, a step stool up there, and Nancy doesn't like me on step stool, so she went up. I gave I steadied her while she pulled it out. <laughs> but God equipped us. He equipped me with a wife to give me guidance. He makes sure I'm not going to kill myself. He equips us to do the things that need to be done. Now everybody's looking. Sorry. Um, fear not. I will deliver you. Fear not. I will equip you. Verse 10. See, I have set you to stay over the nations and over kingdoms to pluck up and to break down, to destroy and to overthrow, to build and to plant. Fear not, I have uniquely prepared you. I took it off the first slide, but remember last week I said, what does the name Jeremiah mean? <clears throat> Yahweh establishes. Yahweh exalts. Yahweh hurls down. Who am I? Jeremiah had to answer that question. God had uniquely prepared him as the one who would pluck up and break down, destroy and overthrow, and build and plant. In his name, we see two positives and one negative. In the prophecy about him, we see two negatives and one positive, but both are, are true. God's plan was to both tear up, but also to replant and to grow his nation. This all had a purpose. So fear not. I have uniquely prepared you. So thinking about that question, who am I? This past week, uh, Nancy was in Lancaster with the, the girls and a birthday celebration there, and, and we're excited about that. But I saw a show come up on TV called 30 for 30. ESPN had been doing those. There are a lot of sports stories. It's a documentary. And I saw the fourth part of the story of the New York Mets. Paul oh, will appreciate that. The 1986 New York Mets that won the World Series. And I, I just... I remember watching that because I, Mookie, Mookie Wilson was a name that just stuck in my head. But the two players that I want to talk about for a moment are Gary Carter and Daryl Strawberry. Mm -hmm. They showed a section, a video, where Daryl Strawberry made a late break on the ball and misplayed it or wasn't able to play the ball. And they were in the away stadium and the whole stadium started 
taunting him, saying, Daryl, Daryl. I've never been in front of thousands, tens of thousands of people mocking me like that. I don't think I'd like it. He didn't like it either. Later he came up the bat, I think he struck out. I don't even know if he took the last swing. Daryl. And he said, when you grew up being told you were worthless, even after success, that still eats at you. And he just talked about what he went through. But then they started talking about Gary Carter. And at one point in the playoffs or the, to get to the World Series or the World Series, Gary Carter came up at a crucial time. He could be the last out. They would lose the game, and, and they would have not continued on. He had been one for 25 at the plate. That's not a good average. He came up, got the hit, won the game. And Daryl Strawberry said, I watched him. And Gary Carter smiled whether he did well or whether he failed. He was smiling. And he says, I realize now his identity was not that he was a good baseball player. He was a Christian. His identity was he was a child of the king. And it made the difference. It made an impact. If you know the story about the Mets, Dwight Gooden and, and Daryl Strawberry, they both were into drugs and they had terrible, they, they finished out there and they won something for the Yankees. Yeah, Yankees, sorry. Um, they, they, just to know, to know that they had that struggle, but they saw in Gary Carter a testimony. And Gary Carter died before he turned 16 in, in, in 2012. And one of his teammates, as they were, he, said, he was such a good guy. Why would God let him die? He said, he's looking at it all wrong. God said, you're done. You've been my faithful servant. Come on home. Come on home. See, we need to look at things from God's perspective. And this was not a Christian production. But Gary Carter's testimony came through. And if you're not familiar with the PTL, uh, that, that Daryl Strawberry. Daryl Strawberry has become a believer. And he speaks about his experiences and his faith. God does things, but we have to know who we are. Jeremiah was the one who would help establish that result, but also roll down. We are called in our identity to serve the Lord. And we need to not fear because he has uniquely prepared us. He will equip us and he will deliver us. Maybe not in this life, but to the next, he will surely deliver us. So we have God's plan, we have God's encouragement to get excited about serving God. When you know who he is and his attributes, when you know what he's promised to do for you. Well, the last thing we'll look at is God's confirmation. God's confirmation. This is really just continued encouragement. And I, I could read this through a couple of times because there's some visions here. You have to understand what the visions were, of, were about. The first one is in verses 11 through 12. And the word of the Lord, Word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? And I said, I see an almond branch. Then the Lord said to me, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform. And I read that a number of times. Did it make sense? What's an almond branch? We have to do some study. What's an almond branch? Almond trees were the first to bud in Jerusalem. They, they, they would bud around uh, January. And they actually bud, uh, I'm sorry, they, they would blossom before the leaves would even come out. So they're the first for that activity of blossoming to show you that the, the season is about to change. But they were the last to bear fruit. They had all, all this early activity, but it would take a whole season before the fruit would come. Now it makes sense. Seasons change, but God's word endures. He said, I'm watching over my word to perform it. You're going to see some things here, but the fruit of it is not going to happen the way over here. So it's okay to see how I confirm my work. I will predict it. Think about Isaiah. People, we studied Isaiah the whole last half of the book. People don't believe Isaiah wrote it because he wrote about so many things yet to come. And they came, he must have written that afterwards. You read those secular articles, that's what they say. But Jeremiah, he's saying to you, Jeremiah, I will show you. And I will do it. And I'll watch over my word the whole time. And it's not just the destruction of Jerusalem that, that Jeremiah is prophesying about. It's to fulfill all the promises that Jeff talked about. The kingdom. 
with a descendant of David who would not just establish a kingdom, but die for our sins and allow us to come into relationship with God. God has been planning that since Genesis 3, since before Genesis 3, but he revealed it first in Genesis 3. The serpent's head would be crushed by the seed of the woman. So we see this, this blessing that seasons change, but God's word endures. The culture's changing, Pastor. We just can't just keep giving people the word of God. Well, tell me when else is going to work better for eternal profit, for eternal blessing. Can't. Only his word. Now we can get better at how we provide it. That's one of the reasons the study school, they looked at what they were doing. They said, we've got to reevaluate. We do this, we did this from time to time over the years, and they decided this. This curriculum that they've chosen is going to give them a lot more um, methods to be able to teach the children. So we need to see that his word endures no matter what the season is. And, and if you're going through a bad time right now, remember, seasons change. It's only for a season. So many people, and the suicide rate, my situation is so bad it's never going to change. That's a lie. Seasons change. Keep looking into his word and let him show you how he, you can endure in his word. Look at verses 13 through 14. The Lord of the Lord came to me a second time saying, what do you see? And I said, I see a boiling pot facing away from the north. Then the Lord said to me, out of the north disaster shall be let loose upon all the inhabitants of the land. This is what he's prophesied. Not a popular message, but it was a true message. In this I see that servants change, but God's judgment prevails. Servants change, but God's judgment prevails. Those of you that have studied Revelation, many people guessing, who's the kingdom from the north that's going to destroy at the end? Who's going to come in against Israel at the end? The, king, the north, the north, the north. Now remember from this map, we pull the map up, we see that Babylon, um, so they said the pointer didn't really work, but Bab Babylonia is over here, actually, it's to the east. But no, no one would travel that way. They would always go up around the Fertile Crescent and come in from the north. But remember, before Babylon, who were the, the major nation? Assyria. God used Assyria, the first part of Isaiah, to destroy and take into captivity the ten northern tribes. Divided kingdom, he took. The, he used Assyria to judge them. In fact, <clears throat> he actually used Assyria to get J Jerusalem's attention. I'll, I'll get to that in a second. But now Babylon was going to be the one coming around from the north to be God's servant. And, and I want you to see. Remember last week we talked about who's in charge, and I used Romans thirteen one. Let every person be subject, subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been in, instituted by God. I stop there, but jumping to verse 4, he says, For he, the one, the one he's put in a governing authority, for he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrong doer. A lot has been happening over this time of COVID. Should we listen to the, gov the government when they tell us we have to do certain things? There is a time to just to not follow what the government says. But if you're going to do that, civil disobedience, you better be ready to face the consequences. Uh, Peter and John said, we have to serve the Lord. We have to serve the Lord. But they got beaten and they got thrown in the prison. So if you want to do civil disobedience, make sure it's for the right reasons, because the consequences may come. And some of the things aren't that serious, some of the things are. We need to see that God uses all those in charge, even if they're godless, he uses them. Even if they're the Taliban, he uses them all for his purpose, to humble the mighty American. God has something that he's doing his servants may change, but God's done. I grew up Russia, Soviet Union. Now it's China. Now who, who's our enemy? God's in charge of all the nations, and he will use them 
for his purpose. And we need to, to, to surrender to God's plan in that. There's one other, uh, verses 15 through 16. For behold, I am calling all the tribes of the kingdoms of the north. That sounds like that's a lot of people. Declares the Lord, and they shall come, and everyone shall set his throne at the entrance of the gates of Jerusalem against all its walls all around and against all the cities of Judah, Judah and I will declare my judgments against them for all their evil. In forsaking me, they have made offerings to other gods and worship the works of their own hands. When you have pronouns, you got to make sure which it's referring to. He's saying, I'm going to use all the nations of the north to judge my people, Judah. I will use them to judge my people, Judah. They will come and they will camp outside of Jerusalem. They will camp outside of Jerusalem and they will take Jerusalem. That's what's going to happen. I want you to remember when God used Assyria to judge the northern tribe, the northern tribe, ten northern tribes, he also used them to, to get Jerusalem's attention. And, and I, this again from a secular uh, source, Assyria, Sennacherib, talked about his conquering through Judah. And it says, after conquering 46 cities, Assyria, no, I'm sorry, as, as for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, they had rebelled against, we saw all those things, that if, this is Hezekiah, this is great, great grandfather of Josiah we talked about last week. As for Hezekiah the Judahite, who did not submit to my yoke, 46 of his strong walled cities, probably exaggerating there, but that's okay, as well as the small towns in the areas which were without number, I besieged and I took them. And he did. He destroyed every city he came against. But when he came to Jerusalem, he set his armies around Jerusalem. And what he wrote about it was, Hezekiah himself, like a caged bird, I shut up in Jerusalem, his royal city. And it ends there. Because he didn't take the city. And secular uh, historians look and say, why didn't he? Why didn't he? He was wiping everybody else out. Why didn't he? Second Kings 19, 35-39. I love reading this verse. And that night... The angel of the Lord went out and struck down 185,000 in the camp of the Assyrians. And when people arose early in the morning, behold, these were all dead bodies. Then Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, departed and went home and lived at Nineveh. And he put these things all on the walls and showed all the things that he had done. But the last thing he says about Jerusalem is, I had him in there like a caged bird. And then I ran away because my army died. God's in charge. God's in charge. So let me say this. Situations change, but God's purposes continue. It would be easy for false prophets to come against Jeremiah and say, God's not going to destroy Jerusalem. Remember, in the days of Assyria, in the days of Hezekiah, he delivered us. He's going to do it again. That's a false prophecy. And the false prophets made much trouble for Jeremiah because he had spoken the truth of God's word. He spoke the truth of God's word. That's the third question. Who speaks truth? Remember? Who's in charge? Who am I? Who speaks truth? People who are in the word of God. Now we can misinterpret the word of God. Believe me, I know. We can do that. But we continue to study and use his word and trust that the spirit will correct us as we continue to submit to him. So we see God's plan, we see God's encouragement, we see God's confirmation. We see all of that to encourage us in following his call, heeding his call. My conclusion is this, our response to, to God and his call should be obedience. That's the option. Jeremiah, you're going to go where I send you? You're going to speak the words I tell you to speak? Are you going to submit to it or are you just going to fight me all the way? What does he say to you? Well, the last couple of verses, 17 through 19, I'm going to look at point by point here for a second. Verse 17 starts out, But you, dress yourself for work. First thing I wrote was get dressed. That's a good thing to do every morning, isn't it? Get dressed. That nothing starts until you get that, right? But when I looked at the Hebrew words there, gird yourself. Gird yourself. You know, kind of get ready. 
And, and the word work means to arise and stand. So instead of saying get dressed, I'm going to say stand up. If you're heeding God's call and obedience, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to stand up. What are you standing for? Stand up. Look at the next phrase. And say to them everything that I command you. Speak up. Stand up. Speak up. What he commands. Sometimes I make myself say things that I think I have to say. Wait a minute. Be sure God wants me to say it. My, my words should be appropriate for the moment. And I don't always know that. <laughs> and I really don't know that. Put the filter on. Wait a minute. How do you say this? Lord, what do you want me to say? When I get uh, something that's kind of a, con a confrontation, I usually say, I'm going to wait and pray about my response. I try to do that. Sometimes it doesn't work that way. Stand up. Speak up. Verse seven, the, the last part of verse 17. Do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. The word dismay means downcast. So let's say, look up. Stand up. Speak up. Look up. As you're standing there, as you're speaking for the Lord, continue to look at him. Stephen did that when he was being stoned. He preached a great message. We don't need the temple anymore. Wasn't well, a popular message in Jerusalem. They stoned him, and he looked up, and I see the Lord standing. God was standing for him, standing at the right hand of God the Father. Keep looking up. And then verse 18, Behold, I make you this day a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole wall, whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. Power up. Power up. You play video games. The old ones that I used to play, I had to go get a power pill every so often. But you're not going to last for very long. We need that. If I'm going to stand, I'm going to speak, I'm going to look up, I need to power up as I look up. And then finally, verse 19. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. I don't have enough phrase here, but persevere. Persevere. Some of them come up afterwards. You should have said this. That's fine, Kelly. I'll fix it for later. Persevere. Troubles are going to come, but Jesus has overcome. We talked about that on Wednesday night. Do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry it's about itself. Sufficient for the day is the trouble. That did not say there will be no trouble tomorrow. It says that's tomorrow's trouble. Look at today. Stand up for me. Speak up for me. Look up to me. Power up and persevere. Don't stop. COVID has not shut down the church. COVID has not shut down you as a believer. To continue to make the truth known because there's a lot of not truth out there we need to speak the truth and call people back to the creator God the God who wants to be their savior the God who will empower them as they follow him as their child and, and he'll be their God it's coming there's a coming a day when God will walk amongst us again we look forward to that but until then he's using us how has he called as I said, we're going to uh, have a time of silence. Maybe now you want to look at this with some fresh eyes. And is, there any, some, is there something in there asking you to think about what you're interested in? This is no signing on the dotted line you're committed for the, until, until the millennium comes. That's not the way we're doing things, right? You're just expressing some interest because as the leaders try to decide what we're going to do, we need to know what you're interested in in our ministries. We also need to know how you can help with them. So Scott's going to come after I pray, and we'll sit down. You have a chance to write that down and then just deposit those in the boxes. It'll be in next week's bulletin as well. Takes, if you need to take more time to pray about that, all, by all means do that. But don't forget it. Try not to forget it. Father, I thank you for the story of Jeremiah. There's so much yet to come, and I only know the, the, the next three sections that we're going to look at for now, but there's so much, and I pray that you just give us wisdom as to when to take a break. Uh, some of these messages may be hard, and we might need to take a break from Jeremiah and find some encouragement elsewhere. But as we watch what's happening in this world, help us to know that you are very much in charge, and you have uniquely called us to speak the truth. Thank you. 
It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our hymn number is number 603. Please stand as we sing. Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. <laughs> 